Thank you for watching the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe. If you can support the museum, please think of backing us on Patreon or joining one of our membership schemes. Or if you watch to the end of this video, you'll be able to see how you can help the museum by buying items from our online shop. We're starting with the very first of the Churchills. So I thought we'd begin by doing the A20. Now I know we haven't got one, they scrapped them, they only ever built two in the first place, so it doesn't really matter, but since they are the lead-in to the Churchill, we ought to start with them. Now the A20 was built at the Outbreak Award, so at least they started it in September 1939. It was regarded as a heavy tank, meant mainly to cross wide trenches. It was referred to as a shelled area tank. It was also known under the title Char de Fortresse, which is a French term for a, a virtually indestructible tank, which is a load of rubbish. It wasn't anything like that. It weighed about 40 tonnes, but it, it had armour only about 60 or 68 millimetres thick, which isn't even as thick as the Matilda II. It was built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, and it was really a dead end. It was built for a sort of another idea of what the First World War would have been like if it was carried on today, or carried on in the Second World War anyway. And that's why they chose the wider trench crossing and the, the ability to move across churned up ground, which was sort of catalogued as a shelled area tank. That's what really makes it an interesting vehicle. Now, the odd thing is that the A20, first of all, wasn't a great success. They fitted it with a Matilda turret. It kept breaking down. But in the end, they involved Vauxhall Motors in Luton in Bedfordshire. And they got Vauxhall to work out an improved suspension. And they got Vauxhall to design a new engine for it, which they produced very, very quickly, actually. It was a remarkable effort. It was a flat 12, but rated at 350 horsepower, which wasn't really a tremendous amount, but it was, it was adequate for a tank of that size anyway. So the tank was brought over to England from Northern Ireland, and they tested it, and they didn't like it. They changed the tracks around and messed about with it a few times, but it failed completely. It ended up, actually, as a ballast load for a tank transporter. That was the biggest contribution actually made to tank development. But from it, Vauxhall Motors started to design, with help from the tank people, of course, the Churchill. It wasn't known as the Churchill then, it was known as the A22 Infantry Tank Mark IV. But we'll call it the Churchill because it was named that a little bit later when they started naming tanks and that's how it's known today. Now the thing is that Vauxhall had never built a tracked vehicle of any sort up until then, but they did have a very sound and large engineering department, and I think that's what attracted the engineers to the idea of them building this tank, and they started building the Churchill. What we've got here is a Mark II. It's actually the oldest Churchill in existence in this country. But it's been done up to look like a Mark I. They've stuck a pretend gun, it's a real gun, but it's the wrong one, in the front there, where the Mark I would have had a three-inch howitzer. But only the Mark I had that. The Mark I had a two-pounder gun like this in the, the turret up here, and the three-inch howitzer in the hull, which was a fat lot of good, because if the tank took up a hull-down position, which they were trained to do when they weren't moving, only the turret was showing and the gun in the hull couldn't fire in any direction at all because it, there was a bank of mud in the way usually. But at least that was put in there. Now the three inch howitzer is a useless weapon at the best of times. It can fire high explosive rounds but there never were any. So it usually just fired smoke. And although smoke has its uses, quite considerable uses in fact, it seems a bit weak to give a tank a gun like that. The other trouble is that the gun itself was in limited supply. They'd only done one or two of them for each tank, and having to do one for every tank suddenly used them up at terrific rate. So by the time they built about 300 of these, they'd run out of guns. 
and they had to take the, where the three-inch gun had been and fit it with a Beza machine gun instead, and that made a proper Mark II. A Mark II was only a Mark I, really, with a change in the hull armament, from a three-inch howitzer to a machine gun, that was all. But um, they are distinct marks. Now, this particular tank was actually lost. It sank in a swamp in the Yorkshire Moors. It was dragged out many, many years later, which is why it's in such a, a rough condition. It was dragged out many years later and sent to the Museum of Army Transport up at Beverly, which was close by. And it was only when that place closed down that it was brought down here to Bovington and we've recently done it up just a little bit to put it on display. So it's actually quite a, a rare tank. There is a real Mark I preserved in Canada, but since we can't get hold of that very easily, we're going to have to use this one instead. But as I say, it's the only Mark II probably left anywhere in the country. Now, all the early Churchills are very interesting vehicles. They've got two things going for them, really, or one thing that's so important. That's a 102 millimetre frontal armour down that place where the driver sits and the, the gunner sits. And that 102 millimetre is actually thicker than on a German Tiger tank. It's not much in area, but it's quite a lot in thickness. And if it didn't fall in your lap, as the whole thing could do, it worked quite well, actually, it made this quite a, a bulletproof tank in many respects. The suspension is odd, it's, um, I've shown you on churches before, but might as well have a look at it on this Mark II. It consists of individual bogies, each one of two flanged wheels, running directly onto the track. Now they're metal, they have no rubber tyres, they make a terrible noise, and although the tank was capable of travelling at about 15 miles an hour, they said that at anything over 10 miles an hour, it deafened the crew inside and made a radio impossible to hear. So the idea was that the tanks went slowly. That didn't matter too much. It was an infantry tank in the first place. But it did sort of later on make life a bit difficult because it meant that they were slow to catch up with the Shermans and other tanks. But that's the basic suspension. The other thing that's quite notable is that the idler at the front has teeth in it. They'd had this in the very first tanks in the First World War, put teeth in the front as well as in the sprocket at the back. But um, you didn't get the track stretching, so it worked quite well for a while and uh, held the track in place. So that's an odd, odd feature of these tanks that you'll find if, if you look closely at one. The tank itself is, as I say, in a very rough condition, largely because it was buried in a swamp for many years and it took a lot of effort to get it out. It's got a door in the side, a square door, with a plug which was normally fitted with a chain and was pulled out and you could fire a revolver through it. If you wanted to, if you could find anyone outside you didn't like, you could shoot them. But um, this one, it's been welded up. But that's how it works. It mean, means that the crew can actually get in through this side door, which is a lot better than clambering in over the top. If you're especially if you're old like me, it makes it a bit easier to get in. Now the other thing to note, apart from the fact that it has no return rollers, it has these skids instead of return rollers at the top, and they carry the track forward on its way round to, to come out. The other thing to look at is the turret, because the machine gun is normally situated on the right hand side of the gun. It's very unusual. Most British tanks have the machine gun on the left of the gun and this one shouldn't have, strictly speaking. The gun should be on the right and the left-hand orifice was for the telescope. So um, that comes in halfway through church and production, as we'll show you later on. Now the other thing you might be interested to know is that the original idea was to fit the Churchill with a 6-pounder 57mm gun. But that gun wasn't ready. So that's why these smaller turrets were designed to take the two-pounder, which is the only other gun they could use, and it gave the tanks a strange appearance. It means you've got a large hull with quite a small turret set on it. It's quite an odd design, really. The turret is a casting, very oddly shaped, capable of carrying three people, 
but only capable of holding a two-pounder gun, machine gun. And the turrets, a thousand of these turrets, were made in the USA and shipped over to Britain. Of course, they were made in the days before Lend-Lease. We had to pay for them being built and shipped over here. And the majority of turrets for these tanks, 1,400 tanks were ordered altogether. At least 300 were Mark I. The rest, say about 1,100, were Mark II. And they're quite interesting. They, they fought very quickly at Dieppe. A few were involved in the Dieppe action. But they were mostly and most famously used in Tunisia. That's where you see most Mark IIs operating. But they were used also for training in Britain because that's virtually all we had at one time. And um, for a five-man tank, which this was, having a driver, gunner or machine gunner at the front and three in the turret, and the big 350 horsepower engine at the back, it really meant that they got quite a good tank in their time. It was quite powerful. It also has a Merritt Brown transmission behind the engine in the back. It was the first time the Merritt Brown system was used, and the Merritt Brown system incorporated the gearbox. For the, about the first 100 tanks, they used a five-speed gearbox, which didn't work used to fall apart, so they changed that for a four-speed gearbox in the later tanks, and that was incorporated in the transmission. So you had this kind of big mechanical transmission in the back, which worked as a, um, a steering mechanism for the tank if it needed it, which it did, of course, and worked as a primary gearbox as well. They were all clo closed together in the back, in the uh, rear of the tank, behind the engine. Now, the other thing to look at is the, the air filter at the back. It's behind me on this one. It's one of the early ones. These early ones drew in the air from largely from the ground. They also pulled in leaves and any other horrible thing they could pick up and made a complete and utter mess of the inside of the tank. They'd even take your hat off and eat that up if they got half a chance. So later on, they were changed. Most of these tanks were later reworked. In the early ones, as you can see, the top run of the track is exposed. In the reworked ones, that was worked, covered in by tin work, and um, a few other things were done to make the tank a little bit more modern. But there's nothing much you can do about the gun. You've still got a two-pounder in there. And that's all there is. So that's the Mark II. That's the earliest Churchill we've got to show you. If you like Churchill tanks or you want to know more about them, have a look at our online shop. We've got a number of different models on Churchill, so you can make the different variants. Uh, we've got David Fletcher's Offspray book on the Churchill tank. But if you like British tanks in general, this is also included in his larger volume, The British Battle Tanks, which takes you through British built tanks in World War II. So there's a lot there to choose from. We have a fantastic selection of books, models, clothes and other gifts on the Tank Museum online shop. When you buy from our online shop, you are supporting the Tank Museum charity and that means we can carry on caring for our collection and producing this content. If you have supported us already, thank you very much. Subscribe and do keep watching.